Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew, and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of plan produce profit. Now, the XY team has spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business. And what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you want to work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, maximizing the benefits of technology to uh, run a a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market. How do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors, going to be 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recordings that I've done so far, the interviews, and, uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So I hope you enjoy this series. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop, easy-to-use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net or visit financialexpress.net for more information. Mr. Wassell, mate, joining us from uh, from sunny, sunny Melbourne town. Thank you. Uh, th- thank you for being here. Uh, you're chatting today. We're part of this uh, Plan Produce Profit series where we've been talking last little bit around planning, uh, planning a compelling service proposition. Um, today we'll be talking about produce and how do you run your business team time efficiently and uh, and coming up in, in a few weeks' time, we've got uh, profit, which is all around getting your message to the masses. And, mate, uh, Verse is an absolute juggernaut, so I, so, uh, I could have definitely got you on for any of the any of those series, but today we're... Um, we're talking all about produce, so looking forward to to squeezing a bit of that gold, uh, that that down south gold um, from that beautiful brain of yours. So, mate, um, before I get into the into the nuts and bolts, though, just to, uh, for anyone that isn't familiar with your business, so Versewell, Melbourne based, uh, clients around the country. How long have you guys been going for? Yeah, well, firstly, Nashi, thanks for having me, mate. Uh, looking forward to having a good yarn with you, and hopefully it's uh, valuable to people out there in cyberspace. We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We will see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but, um, uh, founded Verse uh, about four and a half years ago now, uh, early 2015. So we're, we're still early on, but um, we're maturing, finally. Cool. And your, how long have you been an advisor for? I've been an advisor for eight years myself. Cool. And um, uh, what does your business? What does your business do? Who do you help? Sure. So we are providing personal and impactful financial advice uh, to predominantly professionals that are typically between thirty-five and fifty-five, making good money, disposable income, investing or ready to invest. And ultimately, we're doing that. Our why here at Burst is to help people live their best life. So we really believe, and I know you believe as well, that. You know, the quality of your life is defined by the quality of your decisions and helping people be smarter with money really is a necessary step in helping them, you know, fulfill their life with the things that are important to them. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to deliver as much value to uh, the right people as we can. Awesome, man. So you're covering all different areas of, of finances. There's a, there's a fair sort of coaching element there from, from, uh, from our previous chats, uh, a bit of technical stuff, asset management, the whole, the whole walks and dice sort of thing. It's essentially the whole box of dice. So, you know, it's, it's holistic in nature. It's built on a framework of values, goals, and financial challenges for individual clients and, and couples. 
And, you know, we're covering that kind of broad, broad scope of advice. So here's a combination of advice, it's strategy, it, it's coaching as well, and the right type of client, it's, it's asset management too. Cool. And uh, how many clients do you work with at the moment? Yeah, we've got about 75 what we call journey clients uh, in the business at the moment uh, and also working you know, on a project basis with a number of clients as well. Cool. And your team? What does your team look like? Yeah, we've got, we've got a team of five. So we've got myself, who's one of the financial advisors here. Uh, we've got Daniel Donovan, who's our head of operations and also doubles as a financial advisor. Got Michael back as a head of client experience at Human to Human. He's back he's he. part, of, part of our team. Back he. We know that at some point the great man's going to be listening to this. So, uh, MJB, I hope you are well. Um, we've also got Joreen and Fritz, uh, who Joreen's our head of client experience. Excuse me, she's our client experience manager, uh, and Fritz is our client services administrator. They're both operating at Five uh, in the Philippines, but um, despite the distance, they are. An integral part of our team, our culture, and what we're doing, and incredibly valuable as well. And beyond that, at the moment, um, we're looking for a, a new advisor to join the team, uh, someone quite experienced. I don't know when this is going live, mate, but um, we just want to uh, the seek soon out. Enough, soon enough for this to still be relevant. Uh, yeah, a couple of days ago, and um, you know, the, the, the firm is growing quickly, and we really need to bring in another experienced advisor to um, help us, you know, help more people live their best lives. So, if you are listening to this and, and the content resonates with you, um, <laughs> feel free to, feel free to check it oh, out. Well, all right, all right. That's enough. That's enough. Um, <laughs> mate, I should have asked you if I could ask is you. That, is that against the anti-XY selling philosophy? <laughs> that's right. I'm actually looking uh, looking for another advisor as well. So, you know, anyone in the market, hello at pivotwealth.com, what are you? <laughs> While we're plugging. Uh, yeah, no, I'll get in trouble for that. They might cut it out. Um, but we'll see. They might... They might Clay might listen to the first five minutes of this and just so we can't run it and doesn't want to get live. Uh, I think there is a jobs board on the new platform because they're keen. I, I know that uh, we get a lot of feedback from people that they're keen to to uh, connect uh, advisors that are looking for people with good people. And, uh, you know, in my view, I think a lot of the good people are in the XY advisor community. It's almost to the point that if you're not in there, I would say that you probably, you probably don't have a commitment to you know, understanding what the best in advice uh, actually is. Uh, uh, to me, that sort of said something. So I've been sort of trying to sneakily ask the guys, how, how is it? How can I sort of tap into this? Uh, but I've just, I've just bit the bullet and, and uh, hired a recruiter to help me with it. But, um, yeah, there, there's, there's stuff in the pipe on that, I believe. Also, well, I actually checked out your, your XY Jobs board the other day and um, made a post. And the, the simplicity of UX is, is brilliant. And like I said, and I think too, it's the most progressive community in advice by a mile. Um, so, you know, a lot of things we'll talk about today, given the progressive nature of the people listening to it, you know, probably a lot of them are already across some of these things and hopefully there's some other stuff that's helpful for them. Yeah, that's it. Look, I think that the whole purpose of this series, we've got 15 different advisors, different businesses. Uh, it's not to say that there's one way of doing things because everyone in the, everyone that work that I've been talking to is successful in their own right. But one of the things that I found as an advisor that the way that you learn and and really really you know get to like push push the limits of what your potential is is to go talk to three people that are doing something really well and then pick the one or two little things that sort of jump out and resonate with you that fit with your business with the sort of clients that you want to work with with your approach of doing stuff. And if you do that, then yeah, it's it's that it gives you that fuel for that constant that constant and never ending improvement. And I think, uh, you know, with the things that are going on in the marketplace, it's it's uh, well, it's always important, but more important than ever, I would say. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so oh, revenue ban. Can I ask you that? That's the thing I should have I should have played with you before. Yeah, sure. It, it turning over about seventy five grand a month uh, at the moment. Solid. And how one of the questions I've been asking people is what how much time do you spend working on your on in your business? Yeah, great question. Um, historically not enough, uh, but in recent times I've made a, a dramatic shift to spending you know far more of my time uh, on the business rather than being in it. So part of what I've done in recent times is I've kind of mapped out every working day at a high level for 12 months. So I'm kind of blocking out when am I on the business, when am I in the business. So I've got like I've got um, every Monday for me now 
I don't go to the office. Um, I call it visionary time. It's time where I'm reflecting on myself, our team, our business, our direction. I might even spend half a day reading a book, which I know is going to elevate my thinking. Um, and we have a, a day out of the business every month, which is for our team, our entire team, to go through our OKRs, which I'm, I know you're running too, which we'll talk about. I'm sure at some point um, I have a, a week a month locked out to dedicate entirely just to executing on our OKRs, which is really about developing and moving the company forward in, in an intentional way. Um, and I've also now, like I've locked out, like, you know, every quarter, a week out of the business to really kind of renew and reflect on everything and rethink everything essentially. Um, so, you know, now I, I would probably spend now, I'd probably spend, uh, if I had to put a ratio on it, I'd spend at least a third of my time working on the business. Um, That's awesome. Perhaps, perhaps even over 40% now, which, um, which, I'm, which I'm really enjoying and, and it's more variable time than the time I spend in it. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think that's that's one of the keys to making that that sort of constant progress for sh- for sure. But it's it is so easy to do um, to to get caught up in that in that day to day and working with clients and being reactive and and not being on the front foot. So I think that sort of brings up an interesting point because we're talking for this uh, this part of the series all about efficiency and and I think it's easy for people when they think about efficiency to think about well how you know, how do I connect these two apps together or, um, you know, build the tech stack out a bit further. Mm. But really, I think efficiency can come from a lot of areas. It's how you manage your time, how you manage your team. Obviously, technology is part of it, but how you're working with clients, how you build out your service proposition as well. So what do you see as the key the key sort of uh, areas that, that, are, that are efficiency and 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 then how does that tie into i suppose your journey because clearly you've got this you got this focus on on making sure that you're you're being efficient in how you're working on your business how you work, how you're working with your clients and the, and the team as well um, so yeah so so give us a bit of, of i suppose your your take on that sure yeah so i mean most of probably what we're going to talk about today is what i've learned just through my own mistakes um, and one thing that i'm really now obsessive about is being efficient personally so like when people think about efficiency they're more just instinctively think about their business and like you said how do i make the system more efficient or you know add to my tech stack and those types of things but like business time and personal time it's all time like it's, it, it's all really the same stuff and i think it's intelligent to think about it that way so you want to start with you know setting yourself up for success you know and making yourself at a personal level really efficient and as, simplest, as simplistic as it probably sounds, like that means like being fixated on really kind of nailing sleep, nutrition, and exercise. And really, I think like like in that order, you know, I, I know that the times when you know, I struggle with sleep and I've had that first child in recent years and I know you've just had Margot and we've got our second child coming soon. Like when you don't sleep, your efficiency just like it, it, and productivity and execution, it just goes out, out the window. You know, like if I decide to do it all night or tomorrow, I can guarantee you tomorrow I'll be incredibly inefficient. You know, and then when it comes to like what you put in your body, like if next week I just eat junk food for literally like the whole week, the week after, I'm, I'm going to be incredibly inefficient. Um, you know, so if you can kind of get these pillars right to your own well-being, it makes you not just efficient like for one day or two days, but it makes it sustainable as well. Like you can operate at a higher level for longer periods of time. Um, so I, I kind of start with that stuff. And that's the stuff that I don't, I don't really trade on. I don't trade on sleep. I don't trade on nutrition. I exercise regularly. And I know that when I give up on any of those things, and I have at points along the journey, like when we start the business and you're in startup mode and you know, you're not profitable yet and there's no systems and processes and you haven't got the team and then you have a baby and all this stuff, you know, like then you start – trading on some of that stuff and as soon as you start trading on it, which is a short-sighted decision, things just kind of start to crumble around you and stuff just gets harder. So I start with that stuff and then like beyond that, some of the stuff that I'm doing now um, is about kind of getting more granular. So I've started tracking where all of my time goes, like literally in half an hour blocks, seven days a week, where does every single bit of my time go? Shit. And then, yeah, and then that then then that goes into like a, an Excel spreadsheet, 
what I'm essentially trying to identify is what is the value of how I spent my time for the week or for the month. So I have like columns, right? So I'll have a column which is like um, it's a $10 per hour activity. That's like checking emails, doing basic admin. Um, I'll have um, columns that are like it's a $0 per hour activity. It's like preparing food, making dinner, doing grocery shopping, doing house maintenance, cleaning, you know, running errands, this kind of stuff. I'll have like drinking alcohol and that type of stuff. That's a like it's a negative per hour. <laughs> but not in the short term. Like if you have five drinks, you don't just it doesn't come out of your bank account. But if you're doing that regularly a period of time, it's gonna cost you money in the long run. And then I have like high value activities, which could be like, you know, seeing clients and delivering advice to them, adding value to them. Um, and that might be, say, a $100 per hour activity or a $250 per hour activity. But then even beyond that, then you've really got like the really leveraged activities like reconsidering our pricing model, developing new services, uh, working on marketing campaigns, investing in our culture, um, you know, rebuilding a website, you know, all, all those types of high, you know, creating a board of directors, um, you know, spending time with mentors, all that kind of really high value stuff that mm. tends to get put out of your life because you focus on all the low value stuff because that's all the urgent stuff. We get fixated on urgent rather than unimportant. So yeah. just this, this exercise of just, I've been doing it for only three weeks now, this exercise of tracking where you spend every minute of the day, it just gets you hyper aware. And just like a client we put on, you know, a cash flow system to automate the cash flow, their awareness around the spending goes up exponentially. Yeah. When awareness goes up, when awareness goes up, the quality of decision making goes up, and it's the same thing here. So I started doing that, and once you do that, then the idea is to reflect on the data and go right. Well, um, what can, firstly, what what can I eliminate? So what are the activities? Where am I spending time? And it's really of no value, dependent upon my goals, right? So a no value activity could be I waste too much time on Netflix, too much time on Facebook, too much time on Instagram or, you know, dicking around on LinkedIn and, and, and this kind of stuff. Um, or even stuff like, you know, I spend too much time cleaning my own house, preparing all my meals, doing grocery shopping, all this stuff. So a lot of that stuff I've eliminated and some stuff I've had eliminated for a long time. Like I've got a cleaner, I've got a chef. Um, when I used to have a gardener, I had a gardener. So work out what you can eliminate and then work out what you can delegate. That's the, the outsourcing to cleaners and so on. And it just leaves more time and energy and space for high value activities that ultimately they have a higher value in a in a fiscal sense, but also, you know, investing all your time in the low value stuff doesn't make you much happier either. So um, yeah. creating the time for the high value stuff is gonna move you far more aggressively to the goals that you've got in mind. Love it. And so how do you actually do that? So if you're tracking your your day in 30 minute increments, like how do you remember at the end of the day? Do you do it through the day? Uh, Things yeah, full on, man. What was that? Sorry, that's full on. Yeah. So yeah, good question. So initially, I thought, well, I'll just have an, uh, an alarm on my phone for every half an hour that will go off. But then, like, I might be in a client meeting that might go for 90 minutes. So that doesn't really work. So I've just got into the routine of you know anywhere from you know four to probably eight times a day. Just going, oh, I need to update what I've been doing for the last hour, or last two or last last three hours. And I'll just add it all in. Um, and I'm kind of when I when I go to bed one night before I go to bed, I'm kind of planning tomorrow today in the sense that I know what I'm gonna do for the first three hours of the day. So right, like you know, rise, 5.45, 15 minutes, get ready, go to gym, come home, have breakfast, half an hour, family time, Uber to office, first hour, first half an hour of the office might be go meditate. And then it might be work on this one activity for an hour. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, trying to trying to set myself up for success each and every day as much as I can. Interesting. And how long do you plan to do this for, this tracking? Um, my plan is to do it for a few months um, and work on what can I eliminate and what can I delegate and potentially what can I automate in a, in a business sense. Mm. And then what I think I'll do is I'll go through a period of time where I don't do it and then I'll do it again, um, kind of like a detox where I'll then go, all right, well, maybe bad habits are creeping in, complacency is creeping in, these are kind of natural tendencies, and maybe in three months or six months, I'll do it again for a month. And then I'll, and then I'll you know, I'll refine even further from there. Interesting. What's the most insightful thing that you've got out of it so far? 
most insightful thing. Um, the amount of time that I spend on my phone. <laughs> yeah. I kind of knew it already, but um, it's absurd. Um, I've had an addiction to my iPhone for a long time. I think a lot of people have. I've, de- I've, I've, I've deleted basically all of my apps. Um, they're not there. I can't use them. Um, yeah. And it's just amazing. Like, you know, I start tracking my time on my phone and three hours on the iPhone today, four and a half hours on the iPhone today. Some of it's business calls and the like, but a lot of it's just lost of time that could be deployed towards high value activities. I like it. I have I have a bit of a game with myself with it because they've got that thing that weekly weekly update thing that on that they give you on the iPhone that tells you how much what your screen time what your screen time thing is. And I try to always make it less, although it does make it difficult if you're doing because if you're doing phone calls with your clients all day, then that's that sort of part of it. But I get a real kick when it goes down each week. But it's easy. It's easy to do with you if you're not focused on it. I think absolutely. absolutely. And like with with that in mind, like. People trying to become more efficient in their life or in business, again, I think they're the same thing. Start with like, what can I, what can I eliminate? Like, where is my time being wasted? And get, get rid of those things. Because uh, when you actually reflect on it, if you work out what your goals are, and then you work out where all of your time goes, so much of your time goes into things that aren't moving you towards your goals or creating real happiness for you. So if you're making any kind of reasonable money, Get a cleaner, get a chef, you know, get, get, get a gardener, um, do those basic things, um, you know, get rid of apps on your phone, um, watch less Netflix. doesn't mean you need to spend every waking minute obsessing about what you're trying to achieve, but, you know, if you feel like you're not making the kind of progress you want to be making, then that's perhaps reason to go ask that question of, well, where is my wastage and what can I eliminate? For sure. Cool, and then, and so so for your four and a half years in into your business, I know that you got a pretty schmick, uh, like pretty smooth sort of operation. Now, tell us a bit about your journey with it, efficiency in the business side of the work that you do. You know, working on your business, but with clients, and and how you go about how you've gone about uh, setting things up to to where they are today. Sure, it, it's been a it's been a real journey, and it's not like we've you know we've perfected anything, um, but we have become significantly more efficient uh, and we've operationalized the business to a really healthy degree in the last year or two. Um, I think efficiency in the business sense is really a combination of great people, culture, and systems. And I say a combination of them because I kind of feel like to be really efficient on a sustainable basis, you need to have all three in place. So like, you're never going to be efficient without great people. So yeah. if you've got average to ordinary people in your team, you, you know, you're, you're going to be push, pushing uphill. Um, not even the best systems in the world can make you efficient with people that are disinterested and aren't focused. So you've got to get great people. And then you've got to make sure that they're in the right roles. So you've got to have you know, that old adage, you've got to have the right bums on the right seats. Yeah, and is a mistake that I've I've made in the past. I'm sure I'm going to make it at different points into the future. But making some shifts in our team in the last kind of eighteen months, getting the right people into the right roles has been a real game changer for us and a real learning for me personally. So, got to get great people and got to have them in the right roles. Then you've got to get the best out of them. But getting the best out of them means giving them a great culture and a great working environment. And you know, culture is a lot of different things to different people, but I think if you boil it down to have a great culture, you have to be obsessive about your people and believe your people are your most important resource by a mile. And then if you believe that, it will dictate all of your actions thereafter, which will be about setting people up for success and developing them and teaching and educating them and looking after them and making sure they're happy. And if you've got people, great people that are happy, what they do is they give you great work. Like, they're focused, they're committed, they care, and because they're focused, committed, and they care, they get more done every day. They're way less likely to make mistakes, and mistakes are, like, incredibly inefficient. Like, if you want to be more efficient, you've got to make less mistakes and to have less mistakes without people that are focused and committed and care. Um, so you've got to, got to get that right. And then beyond that, 
you have to create great systems. And this is something like this was, has been a huge challenge for us. It's going to be a challenge forever. But like when we started, because we didn't buy a book, we didn't go and buy an existing business. Like we really started from scratch and we had no systems or no processes. So it means like every time you're going to do something, you're kind of like doing it from scratch and, and, and things are really laborious. So we've really worked hard to try and operationalize the business by creating as many systems and processes as we can. So, yeah, and, and I'm not even the guy in our team that does that. Like Daniel, our head of operations, is incredibly operationally minded, which makes sense if he's in operations. Uh, and up on the right seat there, you might say. I, I, absolutely. You know, like I'm sure at some point he'll listen to this. He has been an integral part, is underselling it in helping us become really efficient the last year or two. Um, but we've, we've created systems for as many things as we can, you know, like the whole advice process, the whole client experience, like it's all a system, it's all mapped out, it's all documented. There's instructional videos for like every single thing you could do in the business as a, as a teammate dependent upon your role. So if someone new comes into the business, you know, someone doesn't have to sit next to them for the first six months and say, this is how you do this thing, let me show you this, how you do this thing. It's just a video that's been recorded. It's in a catalogue with 100 other videos. You know, if it's how do you set up, you know, an account-based pension on net wealth, it's just a video to watch to show you how to do that. Um, so that combination of great people, a great culture and great systems is, uh, is I think, kind of at a high level how you need to, need to think about it. And so because Daniel's been in your business only for, is it 12 months and a bit or am I, am I close? About 15 months. Yeah. So, so how did you approach things before that? We had, uh, we had another client experience uh, manager. Uh, Daniel was our client experience manager before moving into the head of operations uh, role. But we, we essentially didn't, we didn't have different philosophies. We didn't have different thinking. We didn't devalue systems. We just didn't have the right people in the right roles that were system-minded and knew how to build systems. Um. I'm never going to be the guy to be able to build great systems for business and operationalize it. Like, my mind just doesn't work that way. I'm not that way inclined. It doesn't get the best of me. And we didn't have that person in our business that was amazing at that. Yeah. If you don't have that person, it's like, again, come back to good people in the right roles. You don't have a great person in the right role. Like, it's never actually going to happen. It's like trying to sell your product or service. If you don't have a great salesperson in the sales role, no one's ever going to sell it. It doesn't mean you devalue sales. It just means it's not going to happen. So mm. that, that was that was the shift. Right. So <clears throat> we, you, you would have done your wealth dynamics profile before. What's your what's your profile? Um, my wealth dynamics profile. Uh, tip of my tongue, mate. Creator. Start. No. Start. Um, Trader. No. Uh, Accumulator. Lord. No. Fuck, you're pushing, you're testing my limits here. M- m- not mechanic, given what you said there. You allowed to swear on the podcast? Can we do it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Thanks for the green light. Um, <laughs> I, I can't recall. But um, just, just just as we are as we are talking about this, one, one of the other shifts we made um, which has helped with execution. Supporter. Supporter, yeah. So supporter was my highest one, and then beyond that, I think it was creator. That makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, go on. That was bothering me. Yeah. So one of the one of the, the big changes we have made, which I just wasn't thinking about a moment ago, was we adopted a framework called OKRs, which I know you're familiar with. Yeah. And I'll explain it in a moment. Some are going to be familiar with it. Most probably won't. And it's a framework essentially designed to help a company set the right goals, make them measurable. This is across the whole company, right? Not just like the CEO or senior management, the whole company. Mm. Set set the right goals, make them measurable so you know when you're achieving them or not achieving them, and then reverse engineer the actions you need to take to achieve the measurable outcomes. Yep. So we adopted this uh, at the start of this year, so start of 2019, we went away for a four-day team retreat and we launched the OKR framework. So O stands for objectives, KR stands for key results. Yeah. is a, uh, a goal-setting framework essentially made famous by Google. 
Um, the two Google founders adopted it quite early in the process. A guy called John Doer came and worked for them, and he had seen a business use this OKR concept to, 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 to I guess, good success. And they adopted this framework 20 years ago, and they do credit a lot of their exponential growth, like their ability to get perpetually innovate and create like incredible rates of growth down to this 90-day loop OKR system that they adopted. Yeah. So we adopted this in, in, uh, in Jan, as I said, and what it's really done is it has shifted our focus from, from doing stuff to focusing purely on outcomes. So like we've probably been in this trap where you're like, I'm, I'm going to do this project, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to put my time here and focus on this. But ultimately, like, it's really hard to measure the success of that activity. And quite often, your business ends up going in the direction that it just ends up going, rather than being incredibly intentional about where am I taking it, how am I going to take it there. So the idea is that we as a company set our O's, these are our objectives, and they're basically like one-line statements that get the whole company excited and it's a goal really worth shooting for. So we've got we've got four OKRs, it's four O's, sorry, and one of the O's is uh, uh, provide a world-class client experience. So that's the O, right? That gets us excited from a long-term standpoint. And then the question becomes, so what are the KRs? What are the measurable what ways we're going to measure the success to tell us that we're moving towards delivering a, a world-class client experience? So then it's things like, all right, well, we've got to start measuring our NPS and that promoter score. And we know based on research that to be considered world-class, you need an NPS of 80 or above, which is stunningly hard to obtain. Um, yeah. And you know, we've recently surveyed the entire client base and our NPS at the moment is 43, um, which you know characterizes a, a service business, which is kind of around excellent, but by no means world class. Like forty three to eighty is a it's a long road. Yeah. Um, so then, see, so we've got our O, and now we know how we can measure it with our KR. Then the question becomes: All right, well, as a team, over the next ninety days, what actions do we need to take to move the needle on this KR? So you kind of reverse engineering all your actions. You've yeah. got goals worth aspiring to. You know how you're going to measure it, and then you set your actions and you measure the outcome of your actions. And every 90 days, you kind of reflect and go, right, well, what progress have we made, measurable progress? Are we on track if we are great? If we're not and we're not going to hit that KR, then by default, you ask the question of, well, are we taking the right actions? Do we need to change these actions? Do we need to scrap these actions? Do we need to think up new actions? So you're not wedded to what you're doing. You're wedded to the outcome, and the actions are... They're the replaceable part of the whole process. So yeah. what this has done, and I can't, I can't undersell this. I know you're using OKRs now. I'd be interested to hear how you found it. But it just creates this laser focus for everyone in the team as to like where should we channel our time, energy, and effort. And it, it decentralizes innovation and decision-making. So now the whole company is empowered every single person is empowered to like make decisions to innovate to challenge things to be involved in the process of growing and improving the business rather than just being that the cog in a cog you know in the broader wheel yeah um, so that uh, that's something we've been doing for now for about nine months and i see us doing it for a, a very long time and and you know if you want to become more efficient within the business and you have a team um even if you don't if you're a one-man startup, before you have yeah, a team, yeah, I, maybe, I, would, I, would, I would recommend <clears throat> OKRs. Absolutely. And, yeah, look, I think it's a very interesting point that you make because I think I already said that a lot of people get caught up with efficiency thinking it's technology or something, and it's been very interesting having a few conversations like this over the last little bit. Um, but that's a, a quite a different one to quite a different response to, to what some of the other people have mentioned which is it really, and I think it's I think it's a hundred percent valid though that you think about efficiency and, and efficiency is yeah let's be efficient in our day to day and make sure we're you know using time effectively. But a massive part of that is like what is it? What are we focused on? And and where are the energies going? And why are we doing this? And setting people up yeah for, for success. So I I absolutely love that. 
I'm actually not using OKRs. We use a similar um, process around it's based, loosely based on the Rockefeller uh, approach with critical drivers that we, we clearly define success. It just doesn't have the same label, although it's similar-ish. And for me, I've noticed it's a total total game changer because it gives you it gives you permit for me it gives me permission to park things that are good ideas whereas I think it's really easy as a business owner and something that can lead to a lot of inefficiency and something that I've, I've personally experienced this that you get an idea and you go great you go that that's a thing okay I'm going to start working on that and then you go oh here's this there's a market opportunity over there I can make some money doing this other thing and then you're like oh I know what and this needs to be improved and that needs to it needs to be fixed and I could tighten up this process with this other thing and you just end up so scattered that you like you you're just you're, ch- you're constantly changing and everything and it gets it gets overwhelming and then you can lose focus on the you get getting so caught up on you know all these different projects and initiatives that it can take your focus away from you know one you're not doing any one of them efficiently or or following them through to completion or they are getting completed but just very slowly and the other thing is that you don't then you're not focused on your core business, which is like, you know, making clients happy, get more clients, make more money. Yeah. So okay. I, I think that that focus is, is not to be undersold. So just, just so that I can understand how it actually translates in a practical sense. So you talked about yours, be your, your O, which is get to 80 on this, on the NPS. And then you moving from, you want to go, you want to move the needle from 43 to 80. Is it is the um, if you've broken down into your ninety day periods or whatever? Is it is it just that your your um, KR becomes get to forty seven or fifty or something like that? Is that is that how you is that how the uh, you iterate on the on the KR to get to the O or is it some does it involve something else? Uh, so, so just to clarify that the O is not measurable. The O is yes, it's almost like a vision. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the KR, the key result, that's the measurable outcome that tells you that you're achieving the O. So right. it depends on what it depends on what KRs you have. Some KRs should get measured annually. Some should get measured quarterly. Some should get measured monthly as well. Like if you're talking about like you know NPS, maybe you do that quarterly or every six months. Um, we're doing, but if you're talking about things like uh, conversion or revenue or new client numbers, you probably want to do that monthly. Um, so it's it's kind of horses for courses and what you have is or what we have I should say is we have like a Google sheet that the whole team uses so it's really transparent like everyone in our team knows what activities I have committed to on behalf of the team for the next 90 minutes and I need to keep updating them as to where I'm at with them it's all on Google sheet and that has the activities or the actions we're taking but also the measurements as to how we're progressing towards those those KRs as well I love that. I'm just, I'm actually, I'm the coals are turning in my mind because I'm thinking one of you, we've grown, our team has grown from me and uh, Yang in in January to five of us now, and I'm just trying to figure out how do we how do we translate that uh, operationally and to do it in an efficient way. And I think we've got great people, and you get great people, and and you know that's that's sort of a big half of the battle, but there's another big gap um, missing. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like Absolutely. it. Yeah, we can talk about great people and great culture, but great people and great culture isn't enough because we used to have great people and great culture, but we weren't efficient. We didn't have the systems. We didn't necessarily have the right people in the right roles either. So there's uh, you know, there's so many elements to it, and, and like I said, it's just a journey. Um, and you know, we're just we're trying to learn from as many mistakes as we possibly can. Is probably the best way to explain it. Absolutely, man. That's it. That's the uh, that's the, the the great game business, right? So, uh, no, I think that's 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 awesome. I'm definitely going to go do a bit of homework uh, on that one and see what we can we can borrow. Um, but, mate, I, one of the things that that you you have helped me with, uh, I remember we had a a, a conversation at at the, at the great man's wedding, um, uh, which what a, what a wedding too. One of the great weddings. It was indeed, yes. The old Monty was having a ball, um, and I was I was experiencing an ultra frustrating time in my business with our conversion rates, which was wow. just shit house, yeah. and uh, and that was then impacting business performance, obviously, and uh, ultimately bank account balance, which is never a good thing. And uh, we got to chatting about your conversion rate, which was 
something like above 90% of that time. And I was just like, holy crap. And for me, I uh, was having this real, and the conversation that we had was that I was having this massive disconnect between when I got a client, client was blown away. They were super stoked. They're like, this is amazing, super happy. They they will get constantly getting feedback that service is worth more than what we're charging and people are happy. But then when you're having these, uh, these sales conversations, essentially trying to explain the value of the service to people, that it was just there was a bit of a disconnect there. So we'd been spending a lot of time working on a whole bunch of different initiatives, but got to talking to, to you about, about your approach. Clearly those, uh, I think, you know, anyone listening would be happy with the conversion rate of above 90 percent um but one of the things that you said that was a big game changer for you in in your journey and how you approach things and i know it's changed slightly over time but was around sort of charging for your uh for the introductory the dis- discovery session or whatever uh, alignment session yeah. um and 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 how that then flows through to your yeah to to, to running your a client onboarding efficiently. So can you just sort of talk through how you've ended up where, where you have and how you're going about things now? Yeah, sure. So probably it was a bit over two years ago we made some really wholesale changes to like our acquisition or onboarding process, however you want to define it. And it really was to solve a, a couple of really obvious challenges. Um, number one was conversion, like conversion from our discovery meeting to becoming a new client. Uh, number two was resolving a like a rescheduling or a cancellation issue as well. Um, we're having a lot of people, you know, reschedule and put back discovery meetings. This is before we've kind of met them for the first time. Um, and what we did was we we did a few things, but we the, there's two things we did that are probably worth sharing. So number one is we started charging. $195 for our discovery session. Our discovery session goes for 90 minutes. It doesn't involve any financial advice whatsoever. It really is an in-depth personal conversation. And it's now technology enabled, but advisor led to capture someone's values, what's most important to them in life, capture their goals, what they're working towards the milestones they're trying to achieve, and then the financial challenges that they might have. So that's the that's the practical or even the emotional things that are getting in the way of them making great progress with money or building wealth or even just feeling in control of their finances. We do that over 90 minutes. And previously, we had a conversion rate from that session to new client, and there's a step or two in between, but the conversion rate from that session to new client was about 55%. We kind of oscillate from like, you know, some quarters it could be like below 40%, another quarter might be, might be 65 but you know, 50 to 55% was kind of that average. So what we did was we started charging for that meeting, but before they even pay for it, we introduced a session before that, which is a video-only session that goes for 45 minutes called an alignment session for the sole purpose of doing what the name suggests, like working out whether, like, should we do this? Like, are, are we aligned? Are we a fit for you? Are you a fit for us? So we would... You know, we get the inquiry, our CXM would have the introductory phone call go for a couple of minutes. Hey, tell us why you've reached out. Great. First step of the process is this video call. It's called alignment session. Here's the purpose of it. Work out whether or fit. The advisor is going to cover these things with you. Let's book it in. Can you complete a quick survey beforehand? Share some information so we're well informed. And then we'll have that session with you. So we'd have this 45-minute alignment session via video. And basically what we would do in essence is set great expectations like get them talking about them their reasons for reaching out what's working what's not working all high level stuff and what they might value in terms of getting advice and then we say okay great you know we can help with those types of things here's how we help people like here's what we're about here's our approach here's how our service and pricing works ask us any questions that you want we're an open book and we kind of you know, the roadblocks that were stopping people going ahead further down the track, i.e. they're not going to see value, they're not aligned, they don't want an advisor in their life consistently, they are overly price sensitive, they have a husband that doesn't want to be involved, but we don't figure that out until they book their discovery and the one wants to come, but the husband doesn't, so they keep rescheduling, then they cancel. We just did all this stuff up front. And what it meant was that when people went from the alignment to the discovery, and that's not everyone, like our conversion from alignment to discovery is currently, it's about 60%. It 
there aren't. So still plenty of people aren't going ahead. Yeah. These ones that do come into the discovery and we invest that 90 minutes face-to-face and we prepare like a client agreement and then we have a session to tell them how we're going to help at a high level, we'll paint a picture before they sign the client agreement. We're putting in like three, four hours there. It just means that when you put those three, four hours in, there's like this really high degree of certainty they're going to become a client because you've yeah. put it on steroids, you've resolved all the potential issues, they've got all their important questions out you know they're an aligned client. They know they're an aligned client. So they come in, they're excited, they're engaged, they don't reschedule, they pay their 195. So there's a financial hurdle that jump. It's a sign of commitment. And it just means that from there, um, you know, they become clients. So the conversion rate for us now is about 95% um, from discovery to, to, to new client. So that's, that's where it's at at the moment. And we're actually in the process as part of our OKRs uh, of basically disrupting the whole thing and rebuilding it to make it a shorter process, uh, a much shorter process, um, and to make it less key person dependent upon me at this point in time. Um, yep. But um, that, that, were, that were big game changers for us. So I, I would recommend if you're an advisor out there and you are like trying to get people into this first meeting and they're no showing or they're rescheduling a lot or your conversion's nowhere near where you want, to, want it to be, um, improve the level of pre-vetting in a systematic and repeatable way and then charge for your time for that first your first that first meeting and um, if you just do those two things um, it'll it'll make you more efficient because you're not going to spend time on people that don't become advice clients for sure yeah and I think that if I you know when I hear that I would say three or four hours time that's a that's a lot of time that you're that you're spending for someone before they become a client but Mate, if you're converting it at uh, you know sixty percent into the session, and then and then ninety five percent from that session, shit, you you know you'd you'd take that. Obviously, we're talking about efficiency, and the reason that you're on here is because you're not ha- not happy to settle for that. And clearly, there's there's you know there's some way that you can do do tighten things up. But uh, that that is that is an astounding like the, in terms of those numbers. I know that for me, and I, I've said this to you, but. It, uh, I think I've tried with I've tried to use an intro uh, paid intro intro meetings before. Um, we did it for a period of time, and I fell into the trap of uh, trying a uh, feeling that I needed to give a crazy amount of value to people in in these sessions, and and well, to, and also to just not acknowledging the value that comes from reasonably simple to us conversations around helping people get clear on their goals as well i like to put it in context i would when i first started doing we were charging 220 bucks or something Mm. and doing a two-hour session which would often turn into a two and a half hour session Mm. and and unpacking frameworks around our approach to banking um as well as the other part that we were doing, we were talking high level about some investment stuff as well. And what I found was that I was actually doing the people that came to these sessions, I, I was doing them a disservice because I was giving them too much information that they actually couldn't go, they couldn't go and implement it themselves because it, you, you can't walk away from a two hour phone call, a two hour um, meeting or, or video call or whatever. And to, to be able to roll out a framework that, you know, we've spent years sort of refining and developing. But it gave them the illusion that they could because they could see the stuff there. And I think that one of the one of the things that we face a lot with people with their money is that people think that people, there's this like shame or uh, there's like a shame element of, of our clients with their money when they first come to see us because money, everyone's got money, right? Everyone gets a paycheck, the money hits their bank account and it's and people spend money and they go, well, like, it's just money. It should be pretty easy. Uh, but it, as we know that there, there are so many sort of aspects to it. But I was giving the people the illusion that they could go and do this. And then I found that, and I've since converted some of the clients, but 12 months later, because they walk away, they think that they've got this sort of false hope, think that they can do it themselves. Mm-hmm. And then they they realize after time and then actually just not getting results over a longer period of time that they actually can't do it themselves. So I, I wouldn't suggest that as a as a as a way of <laughs> a way of going about things. But I, I think that for anyone listening that's thinking about toying with the uh, with the paid intro meeting, don't feel like you you don't undersell the value that we do give. I actually I've still got this page on my website about the paid intro meeting and what I did because I now I'm not charging for for intro meetings 
But what I did is on that page, I just put the I just put the price up on the website to six hundred and sixty bucks, and I just left it there. Never promoted it. It's sort of behind. It's mm-hmm. like you can get to it, but it's, it's not promoted. Mm-hmm. And um, I had a client that booked that book that just book, just randomly went on the website that I didn't know. They didn't call us up or anything, and they they booked and paid for the for the six hundred and sixty bucks for the session. And I ran the intro meeting exactly the same way that I now run. We do these free intro meetings, which are sort of like 60 minutes, an hour and 15, depending on, you know, how, how keen the client is sort of thing. And I rolled out exactly the same framework and for 660 bucks. And at the end, I was like, guys, I was, I was really conscious because I was like, oh, this is a bit weird. They've, they've just booked this thing and they didn't ask me. Like, they would have asked me. I wouldn't have told them not to pay for it. But they were stoked. They were like, oh, yeah, that was great. I'd love that. You know, we got those philosophies, did that goal setting thing. They were blown away. So I think it's it's a trap that it's easy to fall into as an advisor that you just do stuff day to day and just asking people questions, which can be like the, you know, questions that they may not have thought about or things that you test them, test their, you know, uh, their, you know how, how the purpose behind the, the, the things that they say. And there's a, there is an immense amount of value in that, but yeah, I think um, there's a, there's a few there's a few lessons in that. Like yeah, one one is that like things that are free, people just don't value them that much. It's good to get free stuff. If it's free, you don't really place a significant value on it, and quite often, paying a lot of money for something can make it more valuable. It doesn't yeah. mean it's going to give you a better you know financial outcome necessarily because the more you pay for something might diminish the financial outcome but paying more for something doesn't make it less valuable quite often it feels more valuable and the things that we get for free that we don't have we don't have to give anything up to get them we tend not to value them so much i think one of the other learnings there as well like you're saying is that you don't need to kind of go and give the house away to win a client like De- defining defining someone's problems and having them know you understand their problems incredibly well is like 10 times more important in a sales process than actually solving. If, if, if they are certain that you really understand their problems, they're going to feel pretty certain that you know how to solve them as well. And I think I was just kind of going into solution mode kind of straight away um, and it, it, it's actually not necessary. Then you're kind of giving... You're devaluing what you're doing because you're giving it all away for free. Uh, I know there's competing arguments around all this kind of stuff as well, um, you know. But uh, you know, I, I I do think that in the early phase of a sales process, I don't even like the term, but it's just a, a general term for like an acquisition phase of a service business. Of course, you know, def- de- defining problems and having people feel incredibly well understood. Like if you ask better questions and listen better than anyone else that they've ever met in their life. And help them get a level of clarity around what's important to them and what's holding them back than any else they've ever done in their life. From that point, getting them on board as a client becomes a lot easier. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the things that we really focus on now. And it's not, there are no answers at the start in, in our process. And uh, I, I think that that's, it, it's almost like you if you go too much into solution mode, like in my experience, you, you're almost doing your potential clients a disservice because they just don't know. They don't know what to absorb. Then they don't know. Think, oh, could it, is this something I should just do? Because we sort of make out like it's easy. Like we we're these experts and we understand it, which we do. Wow. But it's when they tra- try to walk walk out of the office and try and translate that to stuff that it, uh, it just doesn't work. So it's almost like you need to t- give them the find that right balance where you. Dem- yeah, demonstrating you understand the problems yeah. uh, without without having to, you know confusing them too much too much along the way. Yeah, what's that old saying? Like uh, people don't buy drills; they buy they don't buy drill bits. They buy the hole in the wall or something. That's right. That's a good point. Yeah, uh, yeah in, in the financial planning context, people aren't buying the strategies. They're not buying the tactics. They're not buying the investment portfolio. They're really buying the outcomes and things that are important to them. That they think great financial advice is going to help facilitate in their life. So yeah. they're really focused on how to find that incredibly well and, you know, that will make it easier. Absolutely. And and I imagine that with uh, with the um, having that structured approach to your new client conversations and, and guiding them through those 
really clearly defined steps and spending that extra time up front. Have you found that that's flowed through to your efficiency in actually the onboarding process then for clients? Because I'd imagine that doing things in, in such a structured way would would really allow you to get for, get them into the groove of your how you go about things, which then has flow through benefits, not just the fact that you're converting strong and, and you're not wasting your time, but then it makes it easier to actually onboard the client. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like um, it, someone said this to me recently, like a business is just a collection of good systems. I think it's more than that, but it yeah. involves a collection of, of good systems and if you want to get efficient, you actually have to have like a system or a process in place that you can iterate and, and make more efficient. Like if you don't actually have the process in place, then you're just kind of like haphazardly like doing stuff and hoping things kind of magically get better uh, over time. But when you actually put a process in place and you document it for the first time, then you have like, then you've got a benchmark. And then you can run that process and then you need to have a rhythm to reflect on it and go is this process working could the process be more efficient how do we iterate yeah. the process to make it better and then once like over time if you just keep doing this consistently over time you get a whole bunch of systems and then the systems start talking to each other and it becomes really smooth and it becomes really predictable as well um so you know we probably spent more time systemizing the onboarding phase of the client experience and any other phase of the uh, experience and you know that now is a collection of systems that, that tend to work really well with each other so it just means onboarding is is really really efficient love it mate as i say i think it, it, it is so super easy to get caught up in uh, in tech and 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 trying to squeeze the juice on that side but some of the, the basics of the stuff that we're doing day in and day out is really where where a lot of our time is spent so anything you can do to make that time more efficiently spent the better yeah right. let me mate um we could talk about this all day no doubt but tell me what do you think uh where do people go wrong you, you may have alluded to some of this already but where do you think people go wrong when it comes to efficiency i reckon maybe you mentioned that at the start of the podcast i think that people think about it on too granular a level like they they just think about like what is that app that i need to add to my tech stack yeah. or how get this app talking to to that app when I think I think before you want to think about efficiency you want to think higher level you, know, you want to you you can be doing doing stuff every day and be really busy and be really efficient because you're getting the things that you chose to do done efficiently but if they're the wrong things and they're the wrong activities then you're going like you're, you're going in a direction, but you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So like, first and foremost, it's about like working out what direction you're going in. This is where the OKR framework has been really helpful for us. And I used to fall into this trap all the time. Like I used to kind of like go home from, from a, a day in the office and, and kind of like be really happy with myself. I think I was really efficient and productive today. I got all these things done and I took 14 things off my to-do list. Whereas now, like, that const I think you're you're an idiot, Corey. Like <laughs> you were doing so many things, but half those things were things maybe you should have eliminated or yeah. dealt that weren't really you know accelerating you in, in the direction that you're, that you're trying to go. So I think people need to they need to start thinking at that higher level before they start thinking about efficiency, and they also you know need to, as I said earlier, like think about it on a personal level and how can I make my entire life, not just my time in the office, how can I make my entire life more efficient and more productive and shift from low value activities to, to high value activities? Um, and it means being it means being quite ruthless and it means really being really disciplined. Um, but uh, I think you know I think they're really necessary in you know becoming becoming yep. efficient. Yeah, I think it's like our lives are getting more and more sort of merged with working life. For me, I know that there's no no difference. I'm on leave right now, uh, clearly. Um, but all, all you know, all of the things, and and it's not even that you have to be doing the most, the highest value activities, but it's do that or do the stuff that's going to bring you real happiness or enjoyment. Like there's a, a lot of things that you want to prioritize. It doesn't mean you have to work 100 hours a week, but 
uh, it should mean that you're, you know, you're working efficiently in the time that you want to work so that when you're not, then you can do the stuff that, that you really want, want to be doing. Absolutely. Like as part of that, that tracking system I have, like family time is a high value activity for me because it makes me happy. It keeps my yep. family happy, you know, downtime and renewal time, you know, is a high value activity, like genuinely relaxing, you know, reading a book for pleasure, like exercising their high value activities because they're kind of like they're, 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 they're all that stuff. Like it's a meditation. It's a force multiplier. You take 20 minutes yep. to meditate, take 20 minutes to meditate. Mm. Every other minute of your, the rest of your day is more valuable because yep. You know, like you, where like if you're if you're a practice principal or a director or have you define yourself like you're you're in the brain game. You know, like I like, and this is something I've had to learn the hard way as well. Like I always just have this great work ethic, and I still have a great work ethic. But I used to kind of define myself on my work ethic and go like, the harder I'm working, the more I'm putting in, and the, the less rest I'm getting. It's just making me tougher and all this insane stuff. Yeah, and and what that was doing, like, because I was burnt out for a long time. What that was doing was like depleting my energy, depleting my ability to focus on things, but also, most importantly, like diminishing my ability to be a really good decision maker and, and have great judgment. Like, if you're in that practice principle role, like your role more than anything is to be a great decision maker and deploy great judgment and you know i have points along the journey where like i'm working so hard i've got not enough downtime you know i'm not doing the things that i'm telling you you know you need to be doing and and i'll have days where like my brain is just like it's like a car with like fumes coming out of it and i can't like i can't even think straight and then and then like the team will ask me this really important question or we need to solve this really important problem and like in my mind i'm like my brain right now, I'm, I'm setting myself up for failure because I don't yeah. have the capacity to think with a level of clarity and focus that I actually need to fulfill this role really well for the team and for the clients. So, like, you know, one thing I've really been trying to work on is that, you know, less is more. Now I work, I don't work nearly as hard as I used to. And the concept of like putting in a long week for me, it's actually, a, you know, it's not that I'll never do it, but. It's not an intelligent week. If I can con confine my working time to 40 hours a week and of that, you know, 15 of those hours can be spent, you know, in a cafe, in a relaxed environment with a cup of green tea and I'm critically thinking about the business at a higher level, like that's the that's a more productive and a more efficient week for me than, than you know, than, uh, you know, working my butt off and doing, you know, 12, 14 hour days. I love it, mate. I don't, I don't care what they say about you Victorians. You're... Uh... Got, got a few good ideas in there for sure. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing okay down here. Not as sunny as you described earlier, but um, there's still plenty of reasons to come down to Melbourne, mate. And, and uh, checking out Verse HQ is one of them. <laughs> mate, it's magical up here at the moment, so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're blessed. Well, it's hard, hard to know with you, mate. Like, you've got a white T-shirt on, but, like, you've, like Daniel and our team said, like, Ben Nash, does he ever wear anything other than a white T-shirt? I don't. I just, this is a freshie. This is straight out of the box, Everlane. Yeah. 20 bucks. I got the pocket back because I got these ones without a pocket. And uh, I just really missed the pocket because, uh, you know, I can take my glasses off, put them in the pocket. Yeah, they, they stay there. It's good. Um, That's an efficiency play, mate. Decision yeah. fatigue. Decision yeah. fatigue. I don't want to waste my, I don't want to waste time trying to make decisions about my outfits. And no one except for Daniel notices anyway. So. Absolutely. What I was going to ask you is, do you have a, a sponsor for the white T-shirts? No, it's a good idea. Although I'm thinking about embroidering the, the Pivot logo on there so I can I can get some tax deductibility out of it. Yeah, I think I think that's a good idea. And the sponsor <laughs> too. Like now with with your leverage and your personal brand, then um, you would have you would have uh, labels jumping at you. Oh yeah. Plus, I'm uh, I you know the for people where inclusivity is is important. You know, I'm even interviewing Victorians now. So, uh, you know, I'm all about equality and all of the things. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, before I get you, before I let you go, um, I just want to hear a couple of quick ones for you. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Hmm. Jesus, good question. Without notice. Um. 
I received a bit of advice uh, two weeks ago from a guy called Joe Duran, who runs a firm in the US called United Capital. Oh, yeah. Um, and probably has done a better task than anyone in the world of, of scaling personal and impactful financial advice and digitized the whole thing. And I had the real privilege of having a coffee with him in his office in Newport in California a couple of weeks ago. And there was a lot of good advice. But one of those, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, do you think about your business as a legacy? And he kind of immediately laughed at me and said, hell no. No, I don't. And I'd always thought of my business as being a personal legacy um, and being an expression of who I am. But he said, you know, I built and sold my first business by the time I was 33. And then when I sold it, I had no identity left anymore. Didn't know who I was. I was completely lost. I had all this money, more money than I ever needed for the rest of my life. And I was miserable. And I went through that process to, and I, I learned that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not my business. Um, my business is just a thing. Like he pointed out this apartment building and said, I think about my business now like that apartment building. I had a vision for it. I built it. I created it. And then I sold it so other people could use it and get value out of it. And he said, you know, at no point ever is my business ever going to cry for me. It's never going to give me a hug when my mum gets sick. You know, it's never going to be there at my wedding. Like it's literally just a thing really. Um, and he said, it's not until you can think about it with that level of pragmatism that you're going to be able to remove your emotion and all your inherent personal biases from your decision making. And if you really want to build a great business, you need to get really good at that. Um, so that was, for me, that was some really valuable advice. I don't know if it was the best advice I've ever had, but um, certainly um, certainly a value. I like it. No? Very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and last one, what's your spirit animal? I don't know. A tiger? A tiger. Ooh. Uh, explain the spirit animal concept to me. Oh come on, man! Really? It's it, like what's your yeah. what's the, what's the animal that you feel encapsulates and embodies your spirit or something? Do I, do I get to choose, or is it based on when I was born? No, no, you choose. Yeah, it's like what you feel is reflective. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, spirit animal. Dolphin. The dolphin. I just I just said dolphin because I saw one in San Diego a few weeks ago. I really don't know who my fire animal is. Man. Is that, is that bad? <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. You're fired. Did we, did we close the shop. <laughs> Probably, yeah. How can you succeed in life without a spirit animal? Yeah. Does that mean we're going to can this podcast? <laughs> it could. It could do. I'll have to let the editors that be. Uh, yeah. I'll have to, uh, maybe I'll, I'll send you an email um, tomorrow. You can add it in the show notes. We'll, put, we'll just post it to the top of the Facebook group for everyone that's wondering. Post, post and pin. <laughs> Legend, mate. Corey, thank you very much. I love it, man. Different approach, but uh, I think some, some real gold there. Uh, awesome, man. So good. Thank you. Thanks, Benny. Pleasure to talk with you, mate, and um, look forward to speaking to you soon. Cool.